Good day everyone, today we're going to talk about the case of Jenny Wiley and Victor of Aviron. These, uh, both of these children are cases of feral children. So before anything else, let us first define the term feral child. A feral child is a term used to describe children who grew up isolated from society or human communities. These kids have never been able to learn language, education, and rules for acceptable human behavior. Ginny Wiley and Victor are examples of these feral children and we are going to learn about them today and why they are such a big part of the study of language acquisition. Jenny Wiley is a pseudonym given to a feral child to protect her name. So the name Jenny Wiley is actually not the real name of the child but rather a pseudonym that was given to her when she was being observed by the scientists and it was also meant to protect her. She became a feral child because of his father, Clark Wiley. So Jeannie Wiley was born to Clark Wiley and his much younger wife, Irene Oglesby. Clark Wiley never wanted any children and he hated the noise and stress they brought along. Clark Wiley decided that his daughter was mentally disabled and that she'd be useless to society. The child was trapped by her deranged father into a handmade straitjacket and tied her to a chair in a silent room of their suburban house since she was a toddler. Jenny Wiley was also forbidden by her father to cry, speak, or make noise. Her father had also beaten and growled at her like a dog, in which Jenny Wiley in her own words recalled, Father hit arm, big wood. Jeannie cry, not spit father. Hit face spit. Father hit big stick. Father hit Jenny big stick. Father take piece wood hit cry. Father make me cry. So Jeannie was a victim of severe abuse, neglect, and social isolation. We can note that at this time, Wiley has already knowledge of a few words to communicate with people, but not a well-constructed one. Ginny Wiley was freed after 14 years when her nearly blind mother, Irene O'Clefby, had mustered up the courage to leave. She or they stumbled on a social services office, mistaking it for an office where they aid the blind. The office workers were immediately alerted when they noticed the young girl hopping like a bunny instead of walking. An abuse case was immediately opened against both parents, but Clark Wiley would kill himself shortly after a trial. Wiley entered UCLA's Children's Hospital knowing only a few words and was dubbed by the medical professionals as the most profoundly damaged child they had ever seen. Wiley's case soon enchanted scientists and physicians who applied for and were rewarded a grant by the National Institute of Mental Health to study her. The team explored the developmental consequence of extreme social isolation for four years from 1971 to 1975. So Susie Curtis, a linguist intimately involved in the, ch the feral child study, said that in the span of these four years, she wasn't socialized and her behavior was distasteful. This study had faced an ethical problem because people had noted that the study is yet another abuse to Wiley. Jeannie Wiley's discovery timed precisely with an uptick in the scientific study of language. So the time that Jeannie Wiley was discovered, the scientific study of language was also a hot topic and at the center of the study in the world of science. To language scientists, Wiley was a blank state. One of the foremost tasks of the Jenny team was to establish which came first. Was it Wiley's abuse or her lapse in development? The scientists were trying to find whether Wiley's developmental delay came as a symptom from her abuse or was Wiley born challenge. Up until the late 60s, linguists believed that children could not learn language after puberty, but Jeannie disproved this. She had a thirst for learning and curiosity, and her researchers found her highly communicative. So, it turned out that Wiley could learn language, but grammar and sentence structure was another thing entirely. 
So these are the statement of Susicrates when uh, about the study of Ginny Wiley. She said that Ginny Wiley was smart and could hold a set of pictures so they told a story. She could create all sorts of complex structures from sticks. She had other signs of intelligence and the lights were on. Wiley showed that the grammar becomes puzzling to children without training between 5 and 10, but communication and language remains entirely attainable. Does language make us human? That's a tough question. It's possible to know very little language and still be fully human, to love, form relationships, and engage with the world. Jeannie definitely engaged with the world. She could draw in ways in which you would know that she was communicating. Jenny was smart and can think of other ways to communicate to people other than using language. Wiley could construct simple phrases to convey what she wanted but constructing a more sophisticated sentence were out of her grasp. This demonstrated that language is different from thoughts. Curtis explained that our thoughts are verbally encoded. But that is not the case for Jenny. Her thoughts were never verbally encoded, but there are many ways to think. Jenny's case helped establish that there is a point beyond which total language fluency is impossible, but if the subject, if the subject does not already speak one language fluently. Now, before we proceed to the next, we should note that in this case, as what I have observed, Jeannie ha already have knowledge about language and already knows how to communicate in her own way even before she was studied by the scientists. She was only struggling with grammar and is not able to construct a grammatical sentences but is able to communicate with phrases. Next case that we are going to talk about is Victor of Aveyron. So Victor of Aveyron is a French feral child who lived in in the woods of Aveyron region in the late 1970s and he was allegedly raised by wolves. Victor was reportedly sighted by the local villagers as early as 1794 and in 1797 he was caught by local, local hunters and brought to a town. A young widow cared for him there but for several months but he managed to escape and return to the woods. He voluntarily emerged from the woods in 1800, and Victor was around 12 years old at that time, and he could not speak any language. A, bio a bi biology professor, Pierre Bonetere, examined him. Pierre Joseph Bonetere. He is a priest, a naturalist, and co-author of an encyclopedia of the animal world. He made the first clinical observations in Victor. He classified Victor as a new hominid species called Juvenis Averio Nensis. So in one of his clinical observations, he removed Victor's clothing and led him outside into the snow. But instead of being upset, Victor was frolicking. He was happy to be outside in the cold weather. So with this, um, Joseph Bonatere concluded that Victor was well accustomed to the harsh conditions of the wilderness and that he was comfortable being naked and had no problem roaming around in cold weather. Another person who observed the boy was John Jacques Constant Saint Esteve. He observed and wrote that there was something extraordinary in his behavior which makes him seem close to the state of wild animals. And then next, he was then taken to Paris, France, especially in Rhodes. Rhodes is a city in France. There were two men who traveled there, each seeking to discover whether or not he was their missing son, but neither claimed that Victor was their son. He was also termed as the hopeless idiot by the great alienist Philippe Pinel, Pinel, also in Paris. He was termed as the hopeless idiot by the great alienist Philippe Pinel, also in, who was also in Paris by that time. 
So great alienist is the archaic term for a, psych a psychiatrist. Felipe Penel is a psychiatrist and he called um, Victor as a hopeless idiot. So the first physicians who examined him, who examined Victor, thought that he was deaf and mute. So he was brought to the Deaf and Mute Institute and he was examined there. It was found out that he was perfectly healthy and that he doesn't have he just doesn't have any knowledge of about language so rock ambroise cucaron sicard the director of the national institute for deaf and mute tried to teach him sign language but eventually gave up and entrusted him to a young surgeon named john mark gaspard itard in 1801 Dr. Itard is a surgeon who was part of Sicard's institution. So during the time where um, Sicard was teaching him sign language, Victor was showing very little improvement when he was in the institution. And this made Sicard frustrated until he eventually gave up and, entrust and, and entrusted the child's rehabilitation to Dr. Itard which was to be funded by Ministry of the Interior. A certain Madame Guerin was charged with providing the needs of the boy, and she was also the one who, named, who gave the name Victor. So Dr. Itard invented various processes to teach Victor language and writing. He wanted Victor, he wanted to civilize Victor um, with the objectives of teaching him to speak and communicate with human emotion. Victor showed progress in understanding language and reading simple words, but failed to progress beyond a rudimentary level. He wrote that under, under these circumstances, his ear was not an organ for the appreciation of sound, their articulations and combinations. It was nothing but a simple means of self-preservation which warmed the approach of a dangerous animal or the fall of a wild fruit. So Victor was in fact able to learn and understand language and was able to read and was able to communicate or draw in ways and how to make himself be understood. But his knowledge about language was taught on the basic level, and from there, it never progressed. This may be due to the fact that the main use for his ears was not to listen and comprehend complex meanings of language, but mainly for his survival in the wild. Both Jeannie and Victor were able to learn language and communication, but not to the point of sophistication. They were able to learn just the fundamentals, but never the complex parts of it. Jeannie and Victor's case can be used as proofs to the language acquisition theories that emphasizes the idea that there should be presence and the influence of the environment of the learner to be able to learn a language fully. Without interaction and socialization, learning will not occur. And so, we also need to note that Victor and Jenny was isolated from a very young age when they were still toddlers and when they were still in their first years of living in the world. Where this, uh, where this time of their lives are very vital in their first language acquisition because from the stages of first language acquisition in children, um, the very vital part of their lives in acquiring a language is from, the fir from their first months because by this time, they start to imitate and pick up words and sounds from their environment. And with what happened to Victor and Je Jeannie, it will it will be very difficult for them to acquire a language because they were isolated from a very young age so this is all for my report if you want to read more about genie and victor's case please do visit these links 
And thank you for listening and I hope you learned something from our lesson today.